702. The Naked Scientist. Time for The Naked Scientist with Dr. Chris Smith. And we are taking your calls with all of your science-related questions on 11 883 702 Your SMS is 31702. Tweet us at Rilebkhile M at Radio 702 using the hashtag 702 Afternoons with the WhatsApp line 072 702 Dr. Chris Smith, how are you doing? Doctor, are you on mute again? Well, I was, but um, <laughs> only temporarily. Uh, I, I, I remain impressed that you managed to say all that you do so quickly and so clearly and succinctly and get all those numbers out without stumbling over a single one. There must be a word for that medically, but I don't know what it is. How are you? I, I'll tell you what it is. It's muscle memory. I think it's muscle memory because um, I don't even read it. It's, it's just now, it's like the driving. I'm not thinking about the clutch and the... So when I do the show and I'm in that mode, though I do still stumble upon my words, sometimes it happens. <laughs> well, I'm very impressed anyway, but good to talk to you. Are you okay? I am good. I am good, except for that weird flu that's going around. Um, I don't know if you, um, in any of your recent studies or from your peers, have heard anything about new flus that um, have come post the pandemic where the flu is just hanging around and not leaving, even with people having taken flu shots. Um, when I was at the doctors and in the hospital, so many people with terrible respiratory issues. Is there something to that effect that post um, COVID there are new flus we need to be aware of or strains that are a lot worse than what we've dealt with before? I wrote a piece about this for one of our broadsheet newspapers in the UK, the Daily Telegraph, towards the beginning of the year because everyone was saying, why am I relentlessly unwell? I've caught this germ and it just won't go. I've been ill for months. And I made the point that, in fact, it's probably more than a one-two punch. It's a one, two, three, four, five, six punch where you're just catching a succession of things, one off the back of the other. And they're all presenting in a very similar way, but they're making you just feel low continuously with vague symptoms. And probably this is connected to COVID. It's not caused by COVID so much as it's caused by the consequences of COVID. Some of the measures that were put in place pretty much comprehensively around the world, included closing down societies, social distancing, telling people to stay at home, lockdowns and so on. And this broke the normal pattern of the cycle of disease, which had been established over hundreds to thousands of years with circulating illnesses that come seasonally. They cause surges in numbers of cases. They then endow people with a degree of protection and immunity against that particular strain. So there are fewer people to catch it the next time. And when we effectively broke up that cycle by two and a half to three years of interruptions by lockdowns and other public health interventions. What we did was to stop people catching the normal things they would catch at the normal time. So people whose immunity would be due to get updated by running into some of these things and they would get a very minor illness as their immunity rebuilt or strengthened itself. Now, everyone's immunity to our vast majority of things has slipped way below the threshold at which you can just catch stuff and not know anymore. We're catching stuff and knowing all about it, and it's catch-up time as we re reaffirm our immunity or reacquire our immunity to some of these things that we've been catching in one form or another over an entire lifetime. So I think that is what is going on. We had that happen in the UK in our winter. Now we're into summer. We've got some summer colds and things. In countries in the southern hemisphere, we're beginning to see winter coming. People are getting those sorts of, of colds worse for longer, just like we did. And it will take a little while for the pattern to reestablish itself as, as the ripples from COVID subside and these other infectious diseases, the seasonal suspects that usually are around at this time of year, they begin to get back into their usual waxing and waning seasonal pattern. And that, I think, is what is at the heart of people having the very symptoms that you've described. I don't think it's one bug in particular. I think it's our overall population immunity to everything has sagged mm. a bit. And so we're mm. catching everything that goes and it's laying us low for a while. Yeah, and of course, the recovery time is, is taking significantly um, longer as well. But I think that helps to just explain that we kind of had a two-year break of no software update. And now we're busy updating right. our software. Now you've got every and virus going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> we need that security software update. And it's been two or three years of not having that. So we can expect that we are going to be ill, but keep doing the right things. Let's go to the lines. We have SEV We're in Edenvale. SEV We're, go ahead. The doctor's listening. So, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. I want to know something, Dr. Chris. When you exercise, you get muscular uh, when you lift, uh, lift. Now, what I want to understand is that we all use, sort of use one hand. I'm right-handed. I use my right hand for almost everything. But I'm not muscular on one side because logically then you should be sort of skewed more muscular on one side because that's the side that you exercise all the time. Why is it that our arms look the same, but they don't uh, work the same? Mm. Very good question. That's a nice one. The answer to this is that to an extent there is an imbalance, there is an asymmetry. Your right arm is slightly stronger than your left arm. But if you think about what you do with your right arm when you're, if you're right-handed, which 90% of people are, you tend to make fine, dexterous movements with your right hand. The kinds of things that would be, for instance, reaching into your pocket, feeling around the edge of a coin to find the right coin or a key, which key do I want? Oh, it's that one. Or I'm going to type something on a computer keyboard. So most of the fine, dexterous movements are right-hand led, but they're not particularly power demanding. When we want to really do something that involves force, we use both arms. So the kinds of force and strengthening exercises that we would do in the gym to build muscles, we tend to do with both arms, and therefore we tend to build those muscles symmetrically. Whereas the ones that involve low force but highly dexterous movements that our right hand tends to be more skilled at performing because we've practiced, because it's our dominant hand, those are using fast twitch muscles that you you don't necessarily need to develop much more because the force is not there. You don't need to make forceful movements with that hand. So I think part of it is that, and I think the other part is that there is a mechanism at play, which is that when we exercise, when we do anything which involves activity, the signals don't just apply to one part of the body. You release growth stimuli or you produce activity through your nervous system and the way the nervous system talks to muscles more broadly across the body so you get a generalized growth as well. So you'll get some region or muscle group specific growth because of force related and impact related exercise. But there's also a sort of generalized call to action, which is, hey, we're very physically active this week. We'll lay down some extra muscle everywhere. And so a little bit of activity goes a long way. You could say you grow everywhere, but not so much so as if you focus on one particular group of muscles and give an extra bit of help to those muscles to get a bit bigger. So I hope that answers your question, but it's a, it's a really nice observation. But now let me then add this, doctor. What if the person in question is a squash player because they are one-handed or like a shot put person who is using one arm? Are we saying that to the naked eye, everything would look exactly the same? No, there is going to be some some asymmetry. And if you look at, uh, say, uh, Andy Murray, I mean, I was, I was actually looking at him playing tennis the other day, you'll see that there is a degree of asymmetry, that you have got more strength coming out of one arm than the other. But because of that generalised signal to bulk up everywhere, you will find that all muscles get stronger by doing some exercise, but the ones you're exercising the most will get that little bit stronger. Some tennis players, of course, do play two-handed, remember, don't forget that. But there is this conversation going on between the nervous system and muscles that makes muscles also grow and when you get facilitation of a muscle group on one side of the body you do also get some facilitation of the other side as well so you'll get some stimulus to grow to keep things balanced up so there will be a bit of asymmetry but not as much as if it was just led by i'm active on this side of my body but not this side so that side wastes away and the other side stays strong it doesn't work quite like that all right, I got you there, Dr. Chris Smith. We'll continue with more questions. We see you, Precious, and the WhatsApp line as well after this. 702. The Naked Scientist. Nine minutes to three o'clock. We're still with the Naked Scientist. We're taking your science related questions on 011-883-0702 and the WhatsApp line 0727021702. And we've got Precious in Benoni. Hi, Precious. Hi, Lewiki. How are you? Hi. Good, thanks. Good, good. Good, 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 good. Um, uh, I've got a question to, for the naked scientist. 
which is quite weird to me. But each time after eating my meals, I just feel sleepy. Like I can't even do anything. I just sleep. Is that normal? Is that encouraged? And if not, what can one do to stop that? Precious, there's a scientific term for what you're talking about. It's called the itis. We call it the itis oh. where you eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Definitely not a scientific term. Dr. Chris, have you ever heard of the phenomena called niggeritis? And again, I'm going to stress that's the colloquial societal yeah. term, not in any way yeah. related to the racial slur, but it refers to that feeling of eating to a point that you need to sleep afterwards and have a siesta. Okay. I've not come across that, but are we talking specifically about nails or are we talking about anything? Uh, Portia? Whatever is not a problem. Sorry, just repeat that again, uh, Precious. Apologies. It's, it's mainly the main meals, like after a big dinner and things like that. That's, what it, well, that's when it happens. But if it's light meals, no, it's not a problem. Okay, Got so you. the feeling of needing to nap after main meals. Yeah, this is completely normal, and it's not just us that does it. I interviewed a few years ago researchers that were studying flies, and even flies fall asleep after a big meal. They did the study where they fed flies a lot of calories, and then they looked at what they did, and they found that they become very woozy and dozy after a big meal. Also, if you're a beekeeper, you'll be familiar with the idea that you put smoke on your hive to calm down your bees when you want to go and do things to the hive. Why do you do that? Well, the answer is that in the wild, bees associate the smell of smoke with a forest fire, appropriately enough, and so they think that their home may be in jeopardy. So what do they do? They go and gorge on all their honey so they can fly away with their larder inside themselves, make a new nest somewhere else, and then burp up all of the honey and store it. They won't lose that, proje- that precious food commodity. When they take in all that food, they then feel sleepy and woozy, and they don't want to sting you anymore. So, Precious, you're basically like a honeybee, and you have a big meal, and then you just want to sleep it off. So we are primed or primed to do that because it's called rest and digest. When you have a big meal, you need to divert lots of your resources, your cardiac output, other bits of your metabolism, into a state where you're gathering calories and extracting calories from what's gone into your intestines, and then you're distributing them around your body for them to be stored and in some cases used sooner, other cases used later. That is best done when you are relaxed and resting. So that's why we have fight or flight versus rest and digest. So when you have a big meal, your brain puts you into a rest and digest mode and you feel very sleepy and it's perfectly normal and you'll be glad to know that you like a honeybee or even like a fruit fly, which scientists have shown do exactly the same thing for exactly the same reason. So, Dr. Chris, the homework for you is to find this term, um, I think, is an informal term from Caribbean or Jamaican um, um, individuals, which then became quite a common term. And the, 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 the definition of niggeritis specifically says a feeling of laziness after eating. So... I'm glad I taught you a new word today, Dr. Well, you have. I'm not sure. I think I'll use that with caution because I could get myself into enormous amounts of trouble. Yes, you might. Ejected from a radio program. I I, I challenge you, Lebo, go on the BBC and say that word and see how long your show lasts. (laughs) Where we are. So the shortened term is the itis. So now we just right, shortened okay. it and we say the <laughs> itis. We all know when you say I've got the itis, it means you want to go siesta and take a nap somewhere <laughs> after a meal. All right, let's go to Tabo in Soshanguve. Go ahead, the doctor's listening. Good day to you, Lewu and Dr. Chris. Speaking again about napping, I would love to know about power naps, power naps. What mm-hmm. happens to the mind or to the body with regards to power naps? For example, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I I felt so tired and and just went into my vehicle. It was about uh, 20, it was about uh, 13.25. When I woke up, it was, I I, I felt so refreshed, so refreshed and ready to go. Only to find out it was 13.32. And I was like, only seven minutes and I'm now refreshed. What is happening with the body or the mind with regards to power naps? I'll listen to all over the radio. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tabo. And I think many of us could do with that trick because as far as I understand, doctor, there is a trick to doing power naps properly and not 
g- go making it too short or too long that you find yourself being more tired than you were before? We've evolved as a species to get sleep at night. The reason is if you retreat away and hide yourself away in a safe place to sleep at night, you're not being eaten by some night active animal that can see better than you can in the dark. That's the theory. So we have adapted to be awake in the day, asleep at night. When we go to sleep at night, our brain flushes out all the rubbish that builds up during the day and it presses the reset button on the levels of various chemicals which it uses as a proxy marker for how long we've been awake. Then, when you start to be awake, you start to accumulate these chemicals in your brain. One of them is called adenosine. And the more of that chemical there is, the more so-called sleep pressure, the tendency to want to nap or fall asleep that you feel. And as it gets up towards a certain point in the day, you will reach a point where you think you feel so tired, you just have to go to sleep. So what do we do? Well, some of us go and have a strong coffee or caffeinated beverage. Why? Because this does several things. Apart from potentiating the action of adrenaline in your body, it also inhibits the action of the adenosine by competing with it in your brain. So it takes away some of the sleep pressure temporarily. So although you're still tired, you don't feel as tired. When you have a nap or a snooze, what your brain does is it flushes away some of that chemical so that you drop the level again way below the threshold where you're beginning to feel fatigued. So you then feel well rested, even though you haven't had a complete night's sleep. It's a bit like if your car's on a low level of fuel and you put a bit in the tank, you can drive a bit further before you start to notice the petrol light comes on again and put a bit more in. It's probably healthier to have a good night's sleep and not get sleep deprived in the first place, but you can make up some of the sleep deprivation with short naps during the day and they are quite restorative for that reason. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris Smith. You are always right on the money with the answers. We'll see you next week.